Hi ladies. All right. So today we are going to dig deeper into Luke starting in verse 15 of chapter four through 735, but we're not going to cover it in detail. You're going to do that this week in your homework or we would be here for days, but we're just going to try and lay a foundation of what we're going to be seeing for the remaining book of Luke through these verses themselves. So as Luke launches into the start of Jesus' ministry, we need to keep in mind two things. First, not everything Jesus did is in all the Gospels. Each Gospel writer chose which events to share that would frame the theme or purpose for their writing. And John even said, if we wrote all the things that Jesus did, we would not have enough books to contain them all. Secondly, as we already mentioned, Luke's Gospel is not always chronological, but orderly. Remember, he's presenting a case for Christ. So Luke begins at a point where Jesus is in his own hometown of Nazareth. So let me give you an idea geographically what that looks like. So to the north, you have Galilee, which is where Nazareth is. Then you have Samaria to the right underneath it. And then underneath that, you have Judea, which is where Jerusalem is. So after leaving the wilderness, he went first to Judea and Jerusalem before returning to Galilee. So from verses 13 and 15 of Luke, in between those verses, there's an entire year that passes that John covers in his book, his gospel. The turning over the tables in the temple, the first miracle at the wedding of Cana, the Samaritan woman at the well, meeting Nicodemus, and many other miracles. Then we will see that he will spend a year and a half in Galilee. Galilee is comprised of about 240 towns, and that is where Luke's focus is on Jesus' ministry up until Luke 9 53 where jesus begins his trip to jerusalem and to the cross so that kind of helps explain 14 and 15 then jesus returned to galilee in the power of the spirit and the news about him spread throughout the entire vicinity he was teaching in their synagogues being praised by everyone so we see he was already making a name for himself and when we start verse 16 of luke we see Jesus was in the synagogue, as was his custom on the Sabbath. So I want to pause here real quick for an interesting history lesson that I just learned this week on Jewish synagogues. Have you ever wondered when and how did synagogues come about? Because they're not even mentioned in the Old Testament. I mean, the place for them to worship was the temple. And the priests would teach the word of God in the temple, but also in their hometowns when they were not on duty at the temple. You know, the, as we learned with Zechariah, you're only there maybe two weeks a year to serve. But in 586 BC, when the Babylonians took the Israelites captive and destroyed the temple, during those 70 years they were in captivity, they were scattered all over the region. So during those times, the prophets and leaders would meet with the people in towns and share the word on the Sabbath. So at the end of the captivity, the people did not have a temple. They continued the practice of meeting and hearing the teaching of the word, which is what birthed synagogues. Synagogue means a gathering place and they were considered houses of instruction. The synagogues never took the place of the temple, which was you know, rebuilt again, a smaller version, um, as we see that Ezra helped to do, but only sacrifices were made in the temple, never in the synagogues. They only served as a way to help people in weekly worship, especially since they couldn't travel back to Jerusalem. So by the time of Jesus, it was customary way for them to meet. And each town and village had a synagogue if there was at least 10 Jewish men that lived there and they were organized this way. There was a ruler of the synagogue who cared for the building and would be responsible to choose the teacher, preacher, rabbi each week for the Sabbath message and the passages for the Sabbath, but would not be the teacher. So they didn't have the same pastor every week teaching them. They used traveling preachers or teachers or even men from the village would teach sometimes. They also had elders who governed the church or the synagogue and the towns. They served as judges and they held court. They were called the Sanhedrin, which we will see at Christ's arrest later in the gospel. There was also a person who would care for and prepare the scrolls each Sabbath and would be the principal over the school at the synagogue, which only taught the Torah, not math and reading and all that but to the young boys in the village and town. So this model of the synagogue is how Jesus was able to preach in synagogues all over Galilee and Judea and the platform he used to be able to proclaim the good news. So interestingly, our churches come from this model. The early church began the same meetings in homes and buildings, but called them churches. I think having this historical perspective will help us understand 
the importance of Jesus teaching in synagogues on the Sabbath and also later on the power of the Sanhedrin that they held over the Jews. So back to our lesson. So why does Luke choose to pick up here? He is setting the stage for Jesus' entire ministry to show his readers that Jesus is the Messiah who was here to proclaim the good news and that he would give his life to save sinners like us. Jesus grew up in Nazareth, a town of about 500 people until he was 30 years old. It was in this town synagogue that Luke introduces as Jesus' ministry, a place he went to since he was a boy with people he knew all his life. Tough place to start your ministry, which makes, you know, those that you grew up with, either as family or neighbors, which makes sense why they could not believe him to be the Messiah. I mean, imagine the boy that lived next door. I mean, you knew his mom and dad and siblings, possibly some of them even taught him in the synagogue as a boy is now claiming to be the Messiah. In verse 16, he says, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. As usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read the scroll of the prophet of Isaiah, which was handed to him. He found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor, to set or to send me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he sits down to teach, which was customary and showed humility. And all who were watching him, he began by saying, today, as you listen to the scripture, as you listen, the scripture has been fulfilled. Those were his first words as he began to preach. Talk about opening with the bombshell. We do not get to hear the rest of the message, but we do know that Jesus selects these verses from Isaiah 61, one and two for a purpose, to proclaim to those listening that he is the fulfillment of this prophecy. He is the Messiah and is announcing his deity. And Luke uses this beginning of the ministry because it's the perfect summary of his ministry. So I wanna take a few minutes to dig into these words that he shares, because it's gonna help shed light on Jesus' message to save sinners and how he lived. So he is the one who will proclaim the good news to the poor. Now, although Jesus had a heart for the outcasts, the poor, the women, orphans, and widows, the use of the word poor Pato shows, has the root meaning beggar, destitute, humble, meek, one who is in need in a spiritual sense, like in Isaiah 61 and in Psalm 107. It is spiritual poverty, one who realizes their need for God. The same word we're going to see in Luke 6.20 and in 7.22 and in Matthew when he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. There's a different word used for financial poor, like the widow who gave all she had, that's pencros. So what Jesus is saying is he has good news for those of us, all people who know they are destitute and bankrupt spiritually, that we can be made right with God, given salvation through his death and resurrection for all who believe. Then he says set free or release. That word in the Greek is Ephesus, Ephesus, it's E-P-H-A-S-I-S, -S, meaning forgiveness. And he says the captives or prisoners. That word accumulate means prisoners of war. It's used in Isaiah 42, five, in Psalm 79, 11, and in Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. So what he's saying is that we're in bondage to sin, guilt, and ultimately we'll face God's wrath. We're also in bondage to the enemy only until we have forgiveness through Christ are we set free. Some people tend to see Christianity as a bondage to rules without realizing that they are in bondage to sin and death and Satan. They're not in control. And it's only in Jesus's forgiveness that we are truly free. He says, give sight to the blind. Now we know Jesus literally healed the blind physically, but it was a spiritual blindness he was wanting to overcome. People are blind to their need for God, their need to repent and their understanding of truth until Jesus through the work of the Holy Spirit opens our eyes. Spiritual blindness is seen throughout the scriptures. Jesus being the light that shines in the darkness. Psalms 82, five, Jeremiah 5, 21, Zechariah one. Jesus calls himself the light of the world and says, whoever believes in me will no longer walk in darkness. And then free the oppressed. That word means downtrodden, distressed. And one who is in great pains of life and can't get free. We see this in the world today. People overwhelmed by fear and strife and conflict, fear of death, everyone has it. But Jesus said, come to me all who are weary and carrying heavy burdens and I will give you rest. 
He also said in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. He is wanting to free us from the burdens of this life as we come to know him. We will realize that our hope is in eternity and that he is in control and his plans are always good. We have nothing to fear and his peace passes all understanding in the midst of our sufferings and troubles. And last, as he proclaims the year of the Lord's favor, meaning this is the beginning of a new life in Jesus and in the one to come. All the promises of God are being fulfilled in Jesus. He has come to share with those who know they are desperate over their sin, those who are held captive by their sin, those who are blind and need their eyes open to the truth, those who are weighed down by this world and its pain. Do you know anyone in those places? Weren't we all in those places before Jesus found us and set us free? We will see that although the people who saw and heard Jesus each responded differently towards him, he was trying to reach them all with his message of the good news. He said, today as you listen, the scripture has been fulfilled. Why was this such a bold and powerful statement? Instead of giving another message looking forward to the fulfillment, he was saying, he is the message fulfilled. Jesus wanted them to know right from the start that his kingdom to come would not be as they expected. Jesus is not here for vengeance, not this time anyway, or as a revolutionist, nor to create peace in the world by force, but peace that remains no matter who is in power on this earth. That peace can only come from him setting sinners free from the penalty of sin and opening our eyes and removing the weight of burdens in our life. He will demonstrate this over the next few chapters and in the remaining gospel as he welcomed and accepted the outcasts, the sinners, the Gentiles and women, and those who were broken by life and over their sin. While trying to get the Pharisees to see their pride and self-proclaim righteousness would not get them into heaven or make them right with God. After facing ridicule and rejection and threats from crowds, especially in his own hometown, that wanted to see further proof before believing. These three audiences that come to hear and see Jesus are still seen in humanity and in the church today. We have the followers who repent, surrender, and believe. The crowd that wanted a sign and a miracle that could get what can we get from Jesus without wanting to sacrifice or commit to Jesus? And the Pharisees and Jewish leaders, those self-righteous that would reject him because he was not what they expected. They were comfortable with their traditions and beliefs and pride. We all know people in these categories. We've been in one of these categories at one time. The question is, where are you now? And this is where we find the next part of our lesson today. As we look at what Jesus did, said, and taught, and how these three groups responded, Jesus first calls us to follow him. We see in Luke 5, Peter, or Simon, who has been with Jesus and heard his messages and saw his miracles, and yet still called Jesus a teacher, another word is a boss or chief, until Jesus asked him to do something that made no sense, cast the net out again. What? During the daytime when fish do not eat, in a location that fish do not go during the day, with night nets that fish would see in the day, not to mention after working all night and being tired. Now, we're not sure how Peter truly responded, as Luke does not say the tone he used, but we can infer from his words and what I just shared when he said, Teacher, I've tried all night to no avail, but if you say so, I will let those nuts down. Was it a willingness to obey or was it a willingness to see who, he, who was right? We don't know. What we do know is, is that it was a miracle and so many fish that it took both boats to haul it in. And Peter in that moment changed his tone and title for Jesus. He was face to face with the Lord and instantly felt unworthy in his presence. He confessed his sinful state and acknowledged who Jesus was. Peter's heart was ready to surrender. He and his brother, along with John and James, left all their possessions and their profession of fishing for fish that would die and became fishers of men that would live forever. So here we see a pattern that we will see throughout the gospel, Jesus coming to sinful man and calling them to believe and follow. Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Titus 3, 4, and 6 tells us, when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. 
We also see in Luke 5, verses 27 to 32, the calling of Levi or Matthew. Levi was in the middle of his job as a tax collector. Okay, he was rejected by Jews for being against their own brothers, also sinful in that tax collectors were known for becoming wealthy off charging people more than what they owed. So here Levi, which was later changed to Matthew by Jesus, was called by Jesus to follow him in the midst of conducting unethical business, showing we do not have to clean up our lives before coming to Jesus. He changes our lives when we repent of our sins and want to obey him as Levi shows by immediately leaving his job and his old life to follow Jesus. He further shows his repentance by inviting Jesus to his house along with his tax collector friends so that they could know this Jesus for themselves. You see, the true sign of salvation is repentance, realizing our need for a savior, and then living in obedience to that, willing to leave behind that old life for a new life with Jesus, and then having a desire to share him with our family and friends so that they can find what we found. Although we don't know their stories, we also see in the response of those Jesus healed, their immediate change and their desire to glorify God. See, when we truly encounter Jesus, we're changed. We can't help but praise God. All three audiences saw and heard Jesus demonstrate his deity, his compassion for all people, his teaching on how we are to live, not only in words, but in his actions. Yet only one of these audiences believed. Why? How is that similar today? Jesus made his mission clear. He is the Messiah that came to save sinners and fulfill God's will by his death on the cross. And we see he gave these three audiences all the truth they needed. He demonstrated his authority as God by making this proclamation in the temple that he is the Messiah, the fulfillment of the promise. He saw, they saw it in his ability to forgive sin, to raise the dead, to cast out demons, to heal people. We also see numerous times where he, it was said he knew their thoughts before they even spoke a word. These are things that only God can do. He makes it his purpose clear to save sinners in Luke 4, 43, that he must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to other cities also for that I was sent for this purpose. And in 531, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. We see Jesus call himself the son of man, the Lord over the Sabbath, and demons recognized his deity. All those proclamations and actions either prove that he is Lord or he's a lunatic. No longer can he be called just a good teacher or a good man while claiming to be the Messiah, unless he is. Then we see his compassion for people. In the case of the man with leprosy, he reached out and touched him. No one touched a leper. They were unclean and possibly contagious. I went to India one time on a mission trip, and part of that we went to a leper colony to minister to the people there, helping clean their wounds and speak to them about God and his love and just treating them like humans. And they were overcome with tears that someone would even care about them. Who knows how long this man had been alone around others with no personal touch. Jesus knew it was what it was like to be rejected and outcast by his own hometown. Jesus met him at his deepest need, not only spiritual and physical healing, but also emotional healing. We see the beauty of the Savior in his heart for each individual person, regardless of background or nationality or sin. Even today, even with us, is there something that is keeping you isolated from others? Give yourself to the Lord. Let Jesus bring you healing and touch you where you're hurt. And then find out ways that you can get out of your isolation by serving others. We also see his compassion for the friends that brought the paralyzed man as he recognized their great love for their friend and their faith in him that they would go to great lengths to see their friend made whole. And Jesus rewarded that with healing for their friend. First, the most important spiritual healing and forgiveness and then physical healing. Do you have anyone in your life that's been that kind of friend to you that would stop at nothing to bring you to Jesus? How do you thank them for it? And who do you know that needs that kind of friend today? Then we see the centurion's servant healing. The compassion of the elders of the synagogue and the centurion who was a Gentile belief in Jesus, knowing Jesus could speak the words and he would heal his servant, which is what Jesus did. The servant wasn't even present. Jesus commended the faith of the centurion, claiming he had never seen such faith in all Israel, showing his love for all nations. We see him then heal widow's son who had died, raise him back to life, 
because of Jesus' compassion for the widow, knowing that she was heartbroken over the loss of her son, but also destitute, as women had no opportunity to make money. She would become a beggar the rest of her life. But Jesus showed up. Even in his compassion for John's doubt, that will be a bookmark in this lesson for today, but it was he was not critical at all, just reassuring. He ended up acknowledging his respect and affirmation of John. We see that Jesus was amazed by what? Faith, faith of the centurion, moved by the friends of the paralyzed man, John the Baptist to name a few. How does the thought that Jesus would be amazed by your faith make you feel? As the Messiah, he also demonstrated his correction of the religious self-righteous works faith faith. I mean, have you ever wondered why he pushed up against the Pharisees and their oral laws? Was Jesus ignoring the laws given to the Israelites? No. We know that in addition to the written laws given to Moses by God, that there were oral laws given, which is much of Deuteronomy. But through the years, the Levites kept adding their own interpretation of the law and making the Jews adhere to these man-made rules. I mean, we see this today in many churches or denominations that have rules and traditions and sacraments that are not found in the Bible. Some even teach that the word spoken by the head of their religion has as much or supersedes the word of God. Lord, help us if we think fallible man's words can override the holy God. That's why it's important to look to God's word for guidance. His word will never contradict his will. We see in these chapters three issues that arise over the traditions of the Jews. The Sabbath, dining with or talking with sinners, and fasting. The Sabbath was instituted by God and Jesus, who was present at creation in Genesis 1, and was given for his people to rest and reflect on what God had done for them, their dependence upon him. It was made for man, not for God, for our benefit, not our punishment. God knows what we need, and he gave us the Sabbath. There was to be no work for personal profit or gain on the Sabbath in order to rest. But the Pharisees became so pharisaical that any action was considered a violation of the law. So Jesus pointed out in numerous examples that healing a person, saving an animal, doing good, even picking grain was something that honored God and reflected God's glory because it was about the heart's intent, not the outward actions alone. So to not help someone was evil. Jesus showed that their being upset that he was eating with sinners in order to share the life-giving good news proved their hearts did not care about people finding God or glorifying God. And then even their condemnation about fasting was out of their own pious beliefs, not the law. God commanded fasting only in Leviticus 16, 29 through 31 for the day of atonement. God commanded fasting um, was to be voluntary and done at a time of repentance or in great need of answer to prayer. It was always to be a private matter, not public show as the Pharisees did and as rebuked in Isaiah 58 and in Matthew 6. Pharisees wanted control and their way of doing things, so they were not willing to open their eyes, hearts, or minds to Jesus, which is the parable of the new and old wineskin and the children. They were not moved or rejoicing when Jesus healed and said they were angry. They were jealous of the crowds he drew. So they set out to find a way to charge him before the Sanhedrin to execute, excommunicate him, execute him eventually, excommunicate him from the synagogue so he couldn't preach or get him flogged or have him deemed worthy of death, which they didn't have the power to do, which is why they had to appeal to Rome. But Jesus saw their sinful hearts, even though they thought they were clean. He also, out of love, was trying to confront their sin for the sake of the Jewish people they led and for their own souls. He demonstrated it in his examples and teaching on how we're to live. He modeled prayer, dependence upon God in his everyday life. And his disciples would ask him later how to pray after seeing his example. We saw it in his teachings in the Beatitudes where he said, blessings for the spiritually poor, those who are spiritually hungry, those who spiritually mourn, those who face rejection because of Jesus, either by family or social media or jobs or any, in any aspect, for you will have what matters, the kingdom of God. You will be filled with God's peace, laughter and joy in life to come. But woe, woe to those who are rich, who do not need God, who fill their full, who laugh at today and without any thought of eternity, who are full of pride and seek people's praise, 
you will not get anything else for you received your comfort. You will be hungry. You'll lack God's presence. You're going to mourn and weep because you did not see your need for God. We see this in our world today as they did back then. We must all come to see our desperate need for God. In doing so, Jesus transforms our lives and we are able to love and serve others, realizing how much he's been, we've been given. Think about how Jesus was treated and how he in turn treated others. He had enemies that wanted to kill him, yet he said, love your enemies, bless them, pray for them. Honestly, it's kind of hard to be angry with someone that you're praying for. Just a little note there. He gave to those who could not ever repay him, the outcasts, the poor, the needy. He said, give to others freely, especially those who cannot give back. You guys have done that by feeding the homeless, by packing boxes for Operation Christmas Child, for ministering at the Lord's place and at the fair, for giving to wholehearted homes orphanage. Thank you. Your reward will be great and you'll be seen as children of God. See, as we remember a God who is merciful to those who do not deserve mercy, us, then we, our testimony will shine through us in how we live. Jesus chose to forgive even those who would betray him, spit on him and crucify him, saying at the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. Jesus gave us grace, not judgment. Who are we to judge others? He said, do not judge others or criticize them. We must first look at our own sin and realize the grace we've been given. Be quick to forgive others because we've been forgiven much. When we give God's way in our love and our time in our prayers and in our need and needs of others and in forgiveness towards others, we will receive back more than we can carry. It says overflowing into our lap. That signified the long robes that they would carry and they could hold it up and even carry more. When we live in the mindset of gratitude for God's grace, we will be a true disciple of Christ and how we treat others, and we will be blessed with more than we could hold. It reminds me, as a child, my mom would make pinatas for my birthdays, and they each had strings coming down the bottom, and everyone would pull, hold a string, and then we would count and we would pull the string. Well, my friends and I got wise that if we wore a dress to the party, we could hold out the bottom of our dresses when the string was pulled and the candy fell, and we would be overflowing with blessing. Jesus then gives us two parables though to drive home the point that it's all about him. He is the good news. Without him, we cannot pretend to be righteous or even do things he taught. The parable of the fruit and the foundation in verses 43 through 49. A tree is shown by its fruit. Who we are is evident by how we live and treat others no matter who we claim to be like the Pharisees. He then shares the parable of the two foundations. Interesting, Matthew calls it the wise and foolish builders, but here Luke focuses on the foundation because it is the reason a building will stand or fall. It's kind of hard for us to understand this concept because here we dig a hole and we pour concrete in and that's the foundation for our buildings. But in that region of the world and in the time of Christ and probably before, they had to dig to the bedrock foundation to start building. Sometimes it would be inches of clay, sometimes it would be 10 feet deep of clay on top. And they could only build in the summer due to the winter rains. But in the summer, the clay would be dried and baked, baked hard to consistency of almost rock. And then it took a lot of work to dig past that to find the bedrock. So if someone was lazy, they could stop digging and say, hey, this is hard enough, I think it's gonna be fine. And it might appear to be stable and strong enough but when the winter rains came, the clay would turn into consistency of putty and the building would topple down. So Jesus is saying that we can appear to have a good foundation. We can believe about Jesus, like the crowd that seemed to believe in his miracles and brought people to him. That seems to be holding us up for now. But the true test is when the storms of life come and when our life on earth ends, will we see if we laid the right foundation? The only foundation that will hold is Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 3, it says, For no one can lay a foundation other than the one that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. As we come to the end of the verses for this week and the end of this lesson, I want to show you how beautiful Jesus' answer is to his cousin John. In verses uh, 7, 18 through 35, I want us to think from John the Baptist's perspective. He was called to usher in the Messiah in his kingdom, but now he sits in a prison. He hears about the hostility and unbelief towards Jesus and he has to be wondering, is this really God's plan for the, how the Messiah will bring about the kingdom of God? And is this God's plan for me? So he sent Jesus the question, 
Are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? This is the same John who gave his whole life to prepare the way for the Messiah, who saw the dove descend on Jesus and heard God say, this is my son at his baptism, who called him the Lamb of God. How could he doubt? Well, have you ever doubted God or questioned why God allowed something to happen the way it did? I know I have more times than I care to mention. I have wrestled with God about his ways because they did not appear to be the best plan. But each time in his love and mercy, he did not criticize me, but lovingly led me to a crisis of faith. Do I trust God in his word or not? He would gently speak to my heart and remind me that even though I do not understand now, someday I will, which is what Jesus said to his disciples before his death on the cross. You know, I had a really dear friend, Sherry, my best friend, who was struggling with cancer. And this was many years ago. And she suffered for 10 years with it. She always had a great attitude. She would always say, you know, people say, why me? Why did the God let this happen to me? She goes, but I just think, why not me? She was always sharing the gospel with people at her cancer appointments. And we prayed and prayed for her healing. And yet God chose to take her. I remember I was really, really upset with God about it. And around that same time, um, I had been given a trip with my company to go to Mexico with some of my coworkers as a reward to this beautiful place on the ocean in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, beautiful house where we had a chef that would cook for us every day and all of our needs taken care of. And yet I was so full of uh, sadness and anger that I was missing everything. I remember standing at the shore and seeing these waves come into the shore, these big waves come into the rocks and the sand. And as I'm standing there, the waves would come in and just pull everything from the shore and suck it right back out into the ocean. And I just thought, God, that's what you do. You just take things away from us that are good. Yeah, I was pretty bad off. And I remember in that moment that something hit my foot. And the next wave that came in and I looked down and there was this beautiful shell. I still have it that God brought along. And in that moment, he spoke to my heart and he said, you are so focused on what you've lost that you are missing all that I've already given you, what I am giving you and what I will still give you. And that really changed my heart in that moment. I think the Pharisees and the religious audience got stuck on the same thing and they missed the beauty at their feet, the Messiah. Is there something that you're doubting God about or letting hinder your trust in him because you do not understand his plan in a situation? I hope this will encourage you today to redirect your heart into believing in the midst of your situation or suffering because he has a good plan. Just like Jesus did not get mad at John, God does not get mad at us. He instead affirms us just like Jesus did for John by reminding John of truth. Listen how familiar this sounds from where we started today. Go and report to John what you have seen and heard. They're witnesses to the truth, that the blind receive sight, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor are told the good news. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. The place we started today with the prophecy that was foretold was unfolding God's good plan, even if it was not the way John or the disciples or the crowd or the Pharisees predicted it would. He also affirms John in his ministry calling to all the crowd, saying John was obedient to the call, and for that he is valued. His life has purpose, and God's good plan was completed through him, completed through my friend Sherry. Then Jesus says, not only will John, who is the greatest ever born of women, be great in the kingdom, but so will the least in the kingdom of God, because we are all welcome as his children on equal footing. Then we end these verses with Luke mentioning the audiences, First, the believers, all people, including the tax collectors, acknowledge God's way of righteousness. That's faith in Jesus. And that the Pharisees who focused on good works and their own self-righteousness rejected the plan of God for themselves. We see the parable of the children not pouting, uh, pouting and not accepting the invitation to join in. And Luke ends this section with a statement in verse 35. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her children, meaning... What we live, believe, and do is reproduced in our children and those we influence. The fruit we produce in our lives is what you're producing shown to be wisdom. Jesus has proven who he is and how he lived, how he taught, how he demonstrated to be the Messiah. He has given us all we need to believe, yet we must choose. 
Are we going to be like the religious self-righteous people who do not think they needed Jesus? They were fine with their own beliefs and good works. Or maybe we believe about Jesus, expect him to do great things for us like a cosmic Coke machine. We put in a prayer and expect good things to happen, but we're not willing to change our life or make him a priority. He's just an add-on to our life. Maybe fire insurance? Or am I a follower of Christ? Where I realize my need for a savior and how sinful I am and have surrendered my life to him. And as a result, I have been set free. I desire to live my life in obedience and surrender to God and his will. Is that you? The true test is in the fruit and how we obey his word, how we deal with sin in our life, how we treat people, how we love, how we give, how we pray, how we share Jesus, and how we deal with the sufferings and disappointments in life. Is Jesus what we live for? I have seen the beauty of Christ more clearly this past year through the difficulties that we have endured. And I am reminded through this study of Luke, the beauty of Christ and his compassion and love and mercy to the sinner, the outcast, the broken, that really reminded me of myself. I was like these outcasts Jesus loved because of my broken, sinful, selfish, desperate choices I made. Choices that led me to shame and guilt and pain I felt when Jesus found me as a 21 year old woman. The weight was so great that I was tempted to end my life. But God in his mercy and grace heard my cry of that broken heart, asking him to show me if he is real. And he answered by sending a friend to invite me to church where I heard for the first time the good news of Christ. I had nothing to offer our savior, but a broken and contrite heart that desperately needed to be forgiven and saved and set free. And he gladly welcomed me. My life changed forever that day but mine was not the only one he was after. Because of his grace, he worked on my family and gave me the greatest honor to share and see my sister, my mom, and my dad come to faith in Christ over many years of praying and sharing. And even though I always felt grateful for the salvation when it happened, today, in the days after my dad's death, and the months after my sister's death, and the years after my mom's death, in the midst of loss and grief, there is this greater overwhelming gratitude to God for his salvation, knowing that they are better than they've ever been because of Jesus. They are experiencing his perfect peace and overwhelming joy. You know, I feel like David when he said, who am I and who is my family that you would choose us? Guys, your salvation is not for you alone. We are the fragrance of Christ that will draw others to know Jesus. I honestly believe that it is through brokenness that we experience the beauty of Christ more fully. Just like the deep fragrance of a rose or the life-giving oil of the olive, or the juice and the sweetness of the grape is only enjoyed after the crushing of that flower and that fruit has happened. We have salvation only through the broken body of Christ that he shed his blood for us. And through our brokenness and suffering, we experience the beauty of Christ more deeply. So wherever you are in your faith journey, whatever audience you identify yourself, Whatever suffering you are in or have endured, guys, Jesus is the answer. He is the Messiah, the fulfillment of all of God's promises. Let's glorify him today and how we live and how we love. After all we have been given, how can we not? Let me pray for us. Dear Lord, we love you so much. We thank you for your word. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your example. We thank you how you did not withhold suffering so that we could be made right with God. Lord, let us glorify you in our lives. Help us to truly know you, not just know about you. Help us to live in a way 
that your fragrance just seeps out of who we are and that people are drawn to you. Lord Jesus, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, ladies, enjoy your time in group.